Well, hello, everyone. Hello to the people on the front and the people in the back. Welcome, and thank you for joining me on this adventure uh, into latency, specifically in the front end, and what we can control. Um, my FOSS friends, you've nearly made it. The conference is almost over, and there's one more amazing talk after this. Um, so I want to congratulate you on making it this far and uh, being a part of something that matters. Uh, this, is, this is a unique conference, um, so way to go, open source friends. Uh, before we get going here, uh, it's a rare opportunity to get to meet other like-minded people, um, and that's what conferences are all about. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds uh, to say hello real quick to someone that you haven't met yet. Go for it. Awesome. I, I opened a can of worms, but we did it. We, we made some introductions. Uh, originally, I was going to play uh, Power of Love by Huey Lewis in the news, but I realized that would be copyright infringement since these talks are recorded. So sorry about that. Not going to happen today. <clears throat> but I do want to just take a moment and say what a beautiful city this is. If you live here, it's awesome. I'm uh, being here as an adult. <laughs> so, like, it's kind of a new experience. Um, most of my understanding of LA has been shaped by movies. <laughs> so so uh, I didn't know if I was going to, you know, uh, show up and uh, it was going to look like this <laughs> or, uh, or if there were going to be strange things afoot at the Circle K or, or if my uh, diet would mostly consist of tacos and donuts while I was here. Um, but all of these assumptions have been blown away. Uh, I'm just grateful to be in this incredible city with you, so thanks for having me. Um, so hi, my name is Ben, and uh, I'm known as Open Source, uh, pretty much everywhere on the web. Uh, my heartbeat is in community projects, and this, this is me uh, helping lead an internationalization summit for Node.js a couple years ago. Uh, I've been involved in these projects over the years, and I work at Datadog uh, to help people know how to observe the front end and get in the flow of utilizing tools to help make sense of their web apps user experience using practices and tools like real user monitoring and globally distributed synthetic testing for front end performance. So that's a little bit about me. Let's jump in. Um, why is understanding latency in web apps important? Because you've got to get back to your family, right? Uh, addressing this latency means that there's more time with your family and friends and less time waiting for your site to load. And most people feel this way about uh, web apps too. So in a recent mobile performance survey used by Google, uh, we can see that the speed it takes to load a page significantly outranks any other major concern that people have when using a web app primarily on their phone. Uh, it's also clear that the probability of someone bouncing from a web app and likely never looking back is over 100% if it took up to six seconds to load. And another important factor is that latency matters to businesses a lot. Uh, in a brilliant progressive web app performance case study from Pinterest, uh, they showed that the sign -ups, their signups increased by 15% uh, when their users' perceived wait time was reduced by 40%. So if measuring and mitigating web app latencies is this crucial to your app's performance uh, and experience, where do, you, where do you start? Well, while considering what to measure on the front end, your initial assumptions might look something like this. Uh, the user sends a request, and there's some initial server boot up time, and then some HTTP handshakes that are made, and then that sets up a secure data pipeline. And then there's the time it takes to deliver a bundle um, and session data and assets and more, which may or may not take more or less time depending on how many files and assets that you need to load at a given time, like lots of pictures of cats. <clears throat> and then there's uh, the time spent loading scripts. 
uh, and rendering the DOM. Like, you know, 653,000 potato, whatever. So we're loading and we're loading in the rendering things. And then finally, uh, everything gets painted on the screen and therefore all the latencies that really matter for your web apps front end perf have been accounted for, right? And now you can be, you know, they can be measured using uh, browser dev tools like Lighthouse and Chromium or alleviated that way, right? Well, no. It uh, turns out that it's not quite that simple. If you're going to meaningfully measure performance, the performance of your web app, a good place uh, to start is to consider the thresholds uh, where you can accurately measure latencies that directly affect your users. And those thresholds are humans, number one, hardware, number two, and then, of course, web apps, which is what we usually think of. But first, we need to take a step back from the front end and understand how latency in our own biological system works. Um, and it seems that human behavior in general is currently the most untapped variable in the web app latency equation. We do know, though, that uh, through the human benchmark study, we've, we've learned that there's an average human response time to new stimuli uh, of about 273 milliseconds. So when you're presented with new stimuli and you react, it usually takes about that long for the average person. And this mental chronometry uh, helps reduce the user's perceived wait time uh, of a single page web app because the user gets to start making decisions about what to do after the first few paints, even if all the content hasn't been loaded yet. Um, for this example here in, in Twitter.com, you can see that as soon as there are contentful paints, uh, the user can start to reason about what they're looking at. Um, First with a splash screen and then, you know, a loading, uh, a splash screen for loading and then with some navigation and content all starts to show up um, even before the tweets from the profiles they follow are loaded. And uh, this all happens long before the full onload event uh, occurs in the browser. So our goal today will be three seconds. Can we load something in three seconds in order to keep our users from bouncing? Uh, we can't just jump into software yet. First, we still need to consider some of the latencies that are inherent to the hardware environment that our apps run in. And the most important thing to note is that there's a significant amount of latency that occurs for an average user by simply using their device's input and output. Um, in light of this video from Microsoft Research, you can see that the average latency in their test range for mobile devices is about 50 milliseconds. And you can see how it drags there and how that's not very optimal. There's less of a latency budget than you think. With that, we'll go ahead and start tracking the latency of our web app's mobile experience and then add 50 milliseconds to the total latency we've incurred just by simply using common hardware. <coughs> Excuse me. And next, uh, we'll add the 2021 average time to first byte metric, uh, which is about 2,600 milliseconds. This includes measurements like cold starts for serverless solutions uh, and more. And now you can see that before we've even done any front end measurements at all, we've nearly spent our latency budget and have uh, almost hit the optimal speed index uh, for our app. And that's too bad, but we'll move on anyway. So let's talk about the front end. According to Google research, 15.3 um, seconds is the average time it takes to fully load a mobile page. So as we fall far beyond the ideal goal of around three seconds, we're now going to see how our app stacks up against the average global load time. And at this point, we finally get to add in the latencies that we're originally considering up front. So let's begin. <coughs> Um, we'll tack on 1,300 milliseconds to load our app runtime uh, data into the browser, like the JavaScript bundle, the assets, session data, and more. And that will bring us up to about uh, 3.9 seconds. And next, our browser is going to parse the incoming scripts and put out any rendering on hold. Uh, put any rendering on hold since JavaScript can't do both on the main thread, being that's a single-threaded runtime. Uh, and this will add about 8,300 milliseconds, bringing our speed index up to 12.2 seconds. 
And now that the scripts are done, the browser can render the DOM and the CSS together into something that it can paint. Uh, this is going to take about 2,700 milliseconds, bringing our running total up to about 14.9 seconds. And then finally, the browser can paint some results for our users to see. This won't take much time, about 400 milliseconds. And now the total index has reached 15.3 seconds, which is exactly the global average for an initial load time on mobile. However, there's still a lot of other tasks that phones and laptops too <coughs> will be processing at this moment since they'll have uh, multiple apps running concurrently. Uh, the system tasks that uh, share resources with our app are also going to add some significant time to the experience here too, say about a thousand milliseconds. And uh, there you go. We've just made it, uh, just made it above the average range for the mobile load time of a single page web app. And it's definitely a long shot from an ideal three seconds, but if we apply some front-end perf best practices uh, in monitoring across the areas that we've measured, <coughs> the total uh, speed index can get significantly closer to that goal. Uh, it's still worth noting that there are also other things that we can consider now in this performance calculation, metal chronometry, and more. I'm going to get a drink of water real quick. <coughs> I feel like I've been wearing a mask this whole time, and now that I'm not, I'm like breathing in dust. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Um, so if the app's first panes include some information about loading, then the initial DOM content gives the user something to do before the app fully loads, and then we can slightly decrease the overall perceived wait time here. <coughs> but this can't this can't be resolved or this can't resolve the fact that it's taking too long to load and to render and all that and uh, to paint the content, right? So shouldn't the goal for total acceptable latency uh, of a mobile SPA be closer to something like three seconds rather than 15? Yeah, something definitely feels broken about this process. <coughs> One more drink. Oh, thank you. <coughs> you know, when we're doing hi when we're doing high level stuff, <coughs> I really love to just like take the uh, you know take the reins there and make it fun. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so you're not like, especially at the end of a conference too, when you've had a lot of you know like data points and things, you know that you've been taking in. Let's have a little bit of fun. <coughs> So anyway, uh, we're done, right? For now? Uh, well, not yet. There are other relevant latencies that are hard to track, uh, but worth mentioning. So I don't know if you've seen this kind of thing before, but this really put it into perspective for me. I was like, oh yeah, maybe there's other stuff going on, and that's why the loading time's taking forever. <coughs> So uh, one of the most significant ones is distance. Uh, the math works such that there's 120 miles, uh, that 120 miles adds around one millisecond of latency uh, to the average packet, which is usually about 500 bytes. And it's a huge culprit in adding latency to the overall experience. Well, another one is uh, regional network congestion. So not all regions have the same amount of bandwidth. <coughs> Uh, allocated to them. And uh, when their traffic gets overly uh, congested, your data will get stuck in it and just be too late. <coughs> so uh, yet another issue <coughs> is local network congestion. So if you have, say, a 100 Mbps uh, internet connection at home, and a few devices are all streaming 4K video uh, while you're trying to load an app on your phone, you're going to have a really hard time, as you can see with uh, your user um, right here. He's screaming in the basement. <coughs> uh, so now uh, that we have a more accurate scope regarding all of the elements that uh, have to perform well in order to deliver a good user experience, let's put together... <coughs> oh, excuse me. Let's put together some useful front end, some useful front end monitoring uh, into action so that we can accurately measure the perf issues that we can do something about. 
Um, configuration specifics aren't going to be in the scope of this talk today. Uh, there's a little bit of code, <coughs> but what I hope to leave you with is an understanding of where you can get started uh, with securing the future of your web apps UX performance quality now uh, with free and open software. And regardless of which implementation you choose to pursue, uh, you can put a solid UX monitoring solution that works for you and your front-end team into your, into your uh, tool belt. Uh, so with that, <coughs> there, are a few way, there are a few ways to get at this. Uh, personally, since I work for Datadog, I typically get to utilize their UX monitoring services directly uh, and their tools streamline what I'm about to cover for you. Um, and of course, that all comes at a cost. For example, all you have to do is add a JS blob into your apps index.js file. And then wowie zowie, <coughs> your user session data just starts streaming in and you can immediately generate averages um, uh, to determine what vectors of your front end are healthy and, or not. But this is scale, right? We're at scale conference. So this is scale and here we don't really care about signing up for more proprietary services. We'd rather understand how to stay in the open and utilize tools that help us uh, do that and, while also supporting the free software ecosystem wherever we can. Um, so with that in mind, <laughs> let's talk about real user monitoring. Uh, real user monitoring um, usually gets perceived as being a product since like big companies have real user monitoring products, but in reality it's not a product, it's a, it's, it's a practice. Um, and it's, it's a term that's not owned by anyone. Um, it's a UX health sustainability practice that's becoming more and more vital to the flow of front end development and it always keeps your web apps useful and enjoyable from the vantage point of your end user. Uh, we're not talking about scraping user data for advertising <coughs> or anything like that. We're talking about uh, understanding every latency from every single session that comprises your actual user experience in aggregate and how we can dependably ingest that as time-based data points in mass and then use them to immediately inform us about how and where our UX issues are coming from. Uh, we do this to knock them out as they arise, of course. Uh, we do this to knock them out as they arise, of course, but uh, <coughs> we can always and forever keep our web apps performant and valuable for everyone uh, who's using or building them. And a, uh, a good real user monitoring solution will help you understand what your core web vitals are across your sessions, all your sessions. So if you're unfamiliar with core web vitals, they are a universally adopted set of three UX quality signals. Uh, that determine essentially how usable your web app is. And here they are. Um, first one is the largest contentful paint, which essentially measures how quickly the app is perceived to be loaded. Uh, the second one is the first input delay, which is the time that the first user, or that the user had their first interaction, uh, like a UI interaction and a response. How long was that? How long did that take? Uh, to successfully occur. Uh, and the last one is the cumulative layout shift, so how much content uh, in your front end shifts during its runtime while a user is trying to use it. You might have experienced the unfortunate situation of being accosted by ads, <laughs> and while you're just trying to use a UI, they shift around, and then you're just trying to you know, go to a blog, but you accidentally click on an advertisement that takes you somewhere else. That is a uh, cumulative layout shift in action. It's actually a terrible user experience and it's uh, tracked <coughs> in this way. So um, we'll, co uh, we'll, we'll cover how you can measure and report the uh, core of vitals uh, from scratch with some vanilla JS in just a little bit. But the next thing your, re your real user monitoring service should support is the notion of end-to-end -end visibility. So you should be able to see the correlation between front-end requests and the time it takes for your back-end services to run and return with whatever the user requested. So in short, uh, this addresses the need for visibility uh, into exactly which processes are affecting your real user's experience and especially the ones that are causing them to bounce, right? Because if you have something that you're, you really care about and you're serving it to a lot of people, you want them to stick around, uh, right? And you want them to stay interested and not like get to experience what you've provided for them at all just because uh, it took too long to load. So this is how you can keep that in check. Uh, for example, you know, you may, there may be an abnormally long delay uh, when your node or Python HTTP request library makes calls to your discount service. 
And there's something in the service script, there's something there that's causing the uh, index page to render extremely late. Like who the heck left to sleep in there? <clears throat> or your initial load time is just horrendous uh, on mobile because of the size of your images and assets that are being loaded. Who thought it was a good idea to put like a six megabyte image in there? You know. These are the kind of issues that real user monitoring helps pinpoint and alleviate whenever they occur. So if you're going to do this without paying for a service that automates it for you, here's some well-worn paths that you may want to consider. You need to correlate a group of services that bring together a solution that's reflective of the tick stack. You may be familiar with that, may not be familiar with that, um, but that is usually the entry point into, uh, into considering uh, monitoring for the front end as well if you're going to stand up your own solution here. And it's usually broken down into f uh, four concerns, and those are to capture time series data from your web app's front end uh, through either continuously polling, say, a f uh, from a file, or handling an inco the incoming data stream from a real user monitoring service that's sending it out. Uh, the second is to use a time series database to store your UX monitoring data. The third would be to leverage a data visualization platform where you can always view your latency averages. <coughs> and the last one is to configure an alert monitoring service that lets you know. I mean, because what the heck are you going to do if you have all this nice stuff set up and then you get to the point where you have to check it manually? You don't want to do that, right? <laughs> you want something to tell you when something's happening. So the last one would be to have that alert monitoring service that lets you know when a bad UX threshold has been reached or if a front-end process has become unresponsive and th or you go out of a range or things like that. I honestly wish uh, it was called something else than a tick stack uh, so that you think about it in terms of what you're doing rather than the names of individual tools, uh, but I digress there. What matters most is that you have a data source, uh, like your web app, where your user data is coming from, uh, a data store or handler, uh, which is the resource uh, that retains your stats visu uh, visual that retains your stats so that you can have visualization of it and it can draw from that um, and then a data visualization tool obviously so uh, where you can calculate and monitor averages that you want to keep track of and, and set alert thresholds against uh, so beyond this there are many core concerns in your business that you can actually get ongoing numbers uh, from uh, through the use of real user monitoring. You might want to set up uh, custom monitoring events that fire in your JS or whatever language you're using at specific points uh, in the user's journey, like to capture important moments like signups. How many signups did you get over time? Or how many logins were there in the last two weeks? Um, or how many posts were published in the last month? Um, you know, or uh, how many successfully completed transactions were there or failed transactions? and those types of things. And, and reporting these uh, as they happen can be crucial to uh, your web app's ongoing uh, sustainability. But in UX land, what I've described so far should be your, more or less your ticket to getting a core understanding of how useful your web app currently is from the vantage point of your real users. Um, so on a high level, let's break it down just a little bit more so that we're familiar enough just to dive in uh, a little deeper later on. Okay, so maybe you didn't design your web app to run on a Commodore 64, uh, like these users are using. <laughs> but uh, there are a growing number of ways to establish high fidelity, a high fidelity time series oriented connection uh, to the UX data that's coming from your web app or data source. And some of these options have been standardized, which is really cool, and are inherent to the current browsers and their APIs. Um, and others come from open source efforts of popular monitoring services. Datadoc has an open uh, browser SDK, things like that. Um, and uh, these can aggregate all that user session data out of, you know, more or less out of the box, so you can try to tap into that. And we'll talk more on that in a few seconds, or a few moments, excuse me. <laughs> Um, but let's cover number, concern number two. So your monitoring data store or handler, uh, here you'll need an API or ingestion service. It could be Influx, the Influx OSS API or Telegraph. And you'll need to configure the API or your ingestion service to be authorized to connect to your data source, like your app for streaming uh, or polling. And then you can configure the API or ingestion service 
for example, Telegraph again, to uh, either continuously scrape a file that you're periodically uh, writing to from your app, um, or to receive a stream of event data from your web app uh, that it can process and, and write uh, to your time series database, like Influx or OpenTSDB, uh, which is a great, great open free software option. So, uh, just so you're aware, I'm not pulling these services like out of the ether. Um, they're popular, you know, these are both popular TFDB services that have uh, been used and battle tested by companies like IBM, uh, Cloudflare, Cisco, Vonage. So there's, there's like, you know, people who depend on this for big infrastructure stuff. <coughs> um, but let's move to concern number three, which is the data visualization. Here, uh, you're going to need to be sending your ingested data out to a high fidelity time series visibility tool like Grafana or Prometheus or uh, and even InfluxDB, which has uh, a great advanced front end now that's called Chronograph. And so uh, using these, you can set up your own dashboards and alerts there. Uh, if you go the InfluxDB route, you can also leverage Capacitor, um, which is their alert reporting system or service, uh, directly through their UI, which makes it really easy to get up and running with alerts. Um, and you can create your own alerts directly there and, and all that, so that's great. Um, and it, it all, it's already uh, built to run alongside your dashboard and all that, so you can get up and running pretty fast. Uh, now let's dive a little bit deeper on what we just like flew through. Uh, I'm not going to go super deep, but I'll go a little bit deeper because that was like a 30,000 foot level overview. <clears throat> uh, but if this is how you're going to get your real user monitoring going, um, I hope that you can at least feel assured that it can be done and uh, that you can be a little bit more prepared to do it, just having thought about it with me here uh, today. So here are some of the ways that you can get at getting those real user monitoring metrics. Um, you can get them out of your web apps uh, in your production pods or VMs or wherever they're hosted. Um, you can utilize uh, APIs that are in your browser natively. There are native brow uh, browser APIs for this, like uh, Performance Observer. Um, and they can, you can continuously calculate and report your latency measurements uh, directly where it matters uh, most to front end for every runtime. Uh, and then either write them locally to the file to be scraped or send them out through a designated port uh, that your ingestion service is listening to so it can be stored uh, as a data point in your TSDB and then visualized in your, um, your uh, dashboard service. But uh, that brings up this question from before. So can you measure core web vitals and other important quality signals this way? Is it really doable? And the answer is yes, you absolutely can. Uh, so briefly, let's cover how you could do that uh, with these APIs. So in the largest contentful paint, what you have going on here is this is a browser API, and you, you instantiate uh, a new instance of it using the Performance Observer API. That's the, that's the one that um, you should really consider uh, that is becoming more and more adopted. Uh, so there's a Performance Observer API. It brings back an object that has an entry list of all the performance events that occurred uh, from basically when the process started running for, to, you know, like navigation or things to like actually be a browser session, uh, and it can return that, and you can get that through uh, an API called Get Entries uh, here, and then this helps us observe uh, and get back the uh, the time series metrics that we really need. Um, y you can observe things like largest contentful paint, which was the first. Uh, core Web Vital we wanted to see, right? And then every time you write one of these into your file or you send it over the, uh, the port, you know, to your ingestion service, then you can, um, you know, you can be assured that uh, those data points are, are getting to the right place every time so that you can uh, visualize them. So that's how, we'd, that's how we'd use something like the uh, Performance Observer API to get a largest contentful paint. Um, or if you wanted to calculate the time to first byte, uh, it's not a core web vital. There's three, but there are more. And this one is very important <coughs> to track in your latency equations. So you might, um, so to do that, you can, you can uh, 
use this um, API here uh, from the uh, Performance Observer, Observer API. So if you like instantiated one and called the performance, you could get the uh, entries that are of type navigation and then do your calculation here by figuring, by grabbing the time that um, the response started. So like, you know, the bigger number <laughs> and then subtracting it, the, the, the smaller number, the time that when your uh, request first started and then figure out when did the user actually get something back? What was the time to the first byte there? Um, and then, of course, you can write that uh, to your file or your ingestion service here uh, and get that duration and time uh, and propagate that. So that that's pretty cool. Um, there's also, there's just quite a, f there's, there's a bunch of supported entry types that you can use to get uh, or calculate your web app's core, uh, your, your web app's vital scores, some of them core web vitals, some, some of them other ones. Um, but, you know, a cool API uh, within, uh, this is called uh, supported entry types. And so if you just grab the performance observer, you know, supported entry types API, you can see everyone that's currently supported. Um, and, you know, of course we can get events, the first input, the largest contentful paint, um, and then you can use other ones through the navigation API. Or you can see what were all the long tasks while the scripting was happening and all that kind of stuff, what was taking a long time and when. Uh, you can use these, uh, these uh, durations that are returned in an object to, to see those. Um, yeah, so then great. That's one route that you can take to get some UX data. And yet another one could be to leverage what an open radio user monitoring service can provide. Um, there is one that Datadog has called the Browser SDK. And it's open source. Uh, and you can, uh, you can grab and go with it. Um, takes a little bit more configuration because there's, uh, you're likely going to run into some authorization issues and things like that that you'll have to sort of dance around. But I've been assured that it can be done. <laughs> so, so like you can, so this is, you, you could try to, like because both the, you know, the SDK, the browser SDK uh, and the, um, the, a the Datadog agent are open source. So if you really want to go in there and reason about it and stand up your own, you could, you know, so there's, there's that. Um, but here's the, the link to the open browser SDK there on GitHub. Um, so how you'd go with that is you would install the agent, which is also open, and there it is uh, in GitHub. You can install the agent and run alongside your web app, uh, and then install data.rum in your front end. And then uh, you can add a connection to the rum service in your index.js uh, file. Um, and then specify a proxy URL, which is a supported API uh, within the, the RUM service that you want to send your data off to. So it could be a service like Telegraph, um, for example, or wherever, uh, for you to relay it to a time series database, you know, like Influx or wherever you want to send it. Now, there's going to be other properties here, you know, that, um, that uh, you'll probably have to finagle a little bit, but that's the main one you need to know about, which is the proxy URL. Um, also, before you send it somewhere, you'll want to configure your ingestion service uh, to mirror the real user monitoring data model uh, a bit uh, so it can play nicely and you can get some really cool metrics out of here. So um, it's, uh, you know, this is the one that's built into the browser SDK and you can model what you want to get to the degree of the events that you want to capture. Um, it reports events based on action types like errors and long tasks and resources and views. And there, are, there are other, there's data that comes uh, along with those objects uh, that you can utilize. Uh, that's backwards. There we go. Okay. So those are a couple of ways to consider um, aggregating data out of your web app and kind of, you know, having some fun messing around with some large, you know, open source solutions or just getting, uh, like if you just want to get some straight up metrics quickly in every instance that's deployed, you can, you know, add those uh, JS API calls and get them out of the browser. That's a really good way to go. Um, but what's a good route for getting a solid uh, time series database going? Um, InfluxDB uh, OSS is one of the most popular options here. Uh, it's probably because it is, uh, it's a single small binary that can be quickly deployed and it uses up minimal resources. Um, and it's worth, it is worth mentioning though that 
there, there's a kind of a divide with uh, the services that um, Influx Data offers between, you know, out of the box from Influx OSS to their cloud services, and that's, you know, it's always this dance that you're jumping around, I feel like. Um, so that's worth mentioning. But if you want to get around that, uh, you should probably look into a tool like Open uh, TSDB, which is a completely open time series database, and it's built on Apache HBase, um, which is a NoSQL time series database. And uh, Open TSDB makes it really convenient to, to scale if you've got a lot of scaling going on um, across all the nodes in your Kubernetes clusters because it implements time series daemons uh, that can receive data from every pod and then store it in an HBase instance accordingly. Um, so it's just, this is like an a awesome, scalable, open uh, way to go if you want to implement something like that. So great. Uh, now that we're aware of what can be done to store our time series data, what are the viable options for visualizing it and uh, easily getting alert monitoring set up? Um, well, if you go the Influx route, there's a, they have a front end called Chronograph, and it's thoroughly integrated with an alert framework that's called Capacitor. Uh, Capacitor is great. It triggers alerts and runs ETL jobs, which are short for extract, transform, and load, and can quickly bring together and detect anomalies in your data, um, which is a really cool feature, so you don't have to set that up yourself. <laughs> and Chronograph's alert monitoring rules align uh, with capacitor tasks that fire alerts whenever the conditions that you've set are met. So uh, your front end team knows about them whenever something occurs. Like when I was first getting into uh, front end observability and front end monitoring, it was like, cool, I can set this up, I can set that up, and I can see stuff. But where it all comes together again is like, when you have something that can just tell you when there's a problem. <laughs> you know, that's like what makes this stuff so valuable, right? Is that you don't have to sit there and be like, okay, I got to check the dashboard again or whatever. No, you just like, if you set up these alerts and your core web vital score, say the largest contentful paint for your app goes above that 2.5 or that three point or that three second threshold, you know, then you just get a, an email or you get a ping or you get a whatever and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, you don't have to worry about thinking about it anymore. It's another thing out of your, out of your cognitive load. Um, so this, this is like, this is where the magic kind of all comes together, is that you can keep your, uh, your experience um, performant and usable, and people aren't going to bounce. Um, so the rules that you set uh, here become stored as tasks, and they generate scripts that are called tick scripts. And these can be edited and, you know, manually if you want. That's a really great way to go. Uh, now let's consider a couple of common useful front-end alert strategies. Um, you might want to trigger an alert when a ceiling or floor threshold is met. So say the threshold for your global average of your, like I said, the, the largest contentful paint goes above three seconds, um, and the bounce rate is going to skyrocket. You can set up an alert for that threshold, or maybe a floor is met. When a, your sign up, oh sorry, your floor is met when your sign up rate fell below your monthly target. Um, that's going to keep your business floating. <laughs> so like, um, you, you need a certain, you need to hit that, uh, you know, certain amount of users signing up. Uh, and if you go below that, it's uh, you're kind of in the danger zone. You could set up uh, an alert for that as well, um, based on the metrics that you're getting out of the, you know, out of how long it's taking to load and if people are bouncing. Um, so maybe you want to, you know trigger a dead man switch when a service fails. Uh, so um, for example, if you have a microservice architecture set up and one of your front end's dependency services just stops running, uh, you don't want your UI to just crash and then people to go like, well, this is a terrible app, <laughs> right? You might, want, uh, you, you might want your service to uh, tie into a switch that then you know, uh, boots up um, a recovery process for that, for whatever front end service that died that kind of thing. Um, so, all right. Uh, I've covered, uh, you know, one well-worn path for using a decent open dashboard uh, tool that has tie-ins easily configuring your alert monitoring. Um, there's, there's one that's worth mentioning, another one, uh, and that would be Grafana. So Grafana alerting is Alerting in Grafana is available uh, for their OSS version and is really popular uh, it within this as well uh, with front-end monitoring. But you're going to come up against an ingestion um, paywall. So like, if you go over a certain amount of sessions, 
you're going to hit their paywall and then they're going to want you to start paying for it. So um, you'll still likely have to assess if that is within what you're going to be doing and if you want to do something like that or build and maintain something else uh, that's going to really work for you no matter how many, many sessions you're getting. Um, you know, so that's, that's always sort of the, the dance with this uh, setting up your own service here. Um, so, hey, before you know, thank you for making it this far. <laughs> I appreciate it. I hope a lot of this, even though it was very high level, um, I appreciate that uh, you've made it this far uh, through here and that you've been gaining some, um, some insight into how you might think about setting up uh, your own you know, FOSS uh, front-end monitoring solution. So before we land this plane um, and you get up and running with uh, real user monitoring uh, so that you have some granular control over these latencies in your production, uh, let's recall what you'll gain uh, from going through the trouble of setting it all up. So number one, you will get to you'll get a uh, a deep analysis of real user session data. We're not talking about like using uh, a web uh, you know browser tool, uh, you know like a, a developer tool like uh, you know like Lighthouse or something like that, where you're just running an audit and then you're like getting sort of a best estimate of how your app's doing based on these figures that have been generated, you know, to run it against the current averages. It's not that. This is real. This is like having something like that, but like everywhere. You know, and that's what makes it really powerful because you know what's actually happening. So you get that deep analysis of, of the real session data and you can assess every latency that's inherent to your services and isolate the bad actors and mitigate them before your users even experience them. Uh, number two is the ability to monitor your UX quality and performance factors like the initial load times, like the core web vitals, and always have their averages on hand so that you can be aware of how they're affecting your actual user's behavior, uh, which will always have an impact on your bottom line. Super important. And then the third one is that you get to retain the inextricable time and resource saving approach of setting alerts that fire when your UX performance averages go over a defined threshold so that you can know exactly what the lat what, which latencies to focus on, lowering in on your, you know, the, uh, to, to lower on your front end and keep your users around. So before we go, let's recall what all comes together to facilitate the performance of your app and what calculating its performance budget might look like as you're setting this up. Don't start here where my initial assumptions were, don't, <laughs> don't do that. Um, measure everything accurately at each impactful vector using the practice of real user monitoring so that you can get a real view into what people are really experiencing uh, when they use it. And with this, you now have the power to help everyone get a little bit more of their more, most precious resource back, which is their time, uh, which I'm now going to give back to you. So. Thank you very much. Uh, if you'd like to catch up with me and talk about anything or just stay in touch, uh, you can find me in these places. Uh, here I am on Twitter. There's my site, my blog, and my GitHub. So please feel free to reach out anytime. Uh, thanks again. It's been wonderful to uh, be with you here at Scale. Um, I'm so grateful to be at a Linux conference. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and definitely don't miss the closing keynote, which is coming up next. Like I said, you're almost there. Uh, Vint Cerf is next, and he's going to be talking about the importance of open source to the Internet's success, which is huge. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he'll be sharing lessons learned and what he would approach differently if he were doing it again. And that's going to be rad. So thanks a lot, and we'll see you next time. I'll be around for a few minutes, too, if you have any questions. Yeah? Yeah.
Um, ki uh, kind of. So I think what you're saying is, is tracking latencies like, is, is, tracking, is tracking latencies the developer's responsibility? Can you, can you restate that again real quick? Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. I think I think people owning everything that they possibly can for their own space is extreme. Just as a general baseline approach, is extremely important, and this is one of them. Uh, you know, it is uh, it, like as a front end developer, it should be. In, like uh, performance and latency should be a huge thing for you, and so like doing everything that you can to follow best practices. So like if I mean just you know things that are becoming more commonplace now. Like if you are loading a million posts, you don't want to load them all at once, you know, or you don't want to like so you want to do lazy loading, or uh, you know you want to implement those practices. If you've got images that are too big, you want to make them web ready before you put out your app. You know, like that kind of stuff is definitely on the front end developer to, to track and to maintain to, um, to make it as uh, enjoyable as possible. Um, there are a lot, uh, which I, I feel like I covered a little bit here, but I could have get, gotten a little bit more in depth. Um, this really also ties into the end-to-end -end visibility side of things. So like as a front-end developer, kind of the magic of setting up a release or monitoring solution is that you can start to dive in and be like, oh, it was a Python Flask call, you know, like HTTP call that's like, you know, timing out for some reason that's making this, uh, you know, you piece of UI just do nothing for three seconds or whatever, <laughs> you know, and that really sucks. So you can, like, there's like a, it depends on like what kind of, um, what your responsibilities are as a developer, I feel like. So, um, you know, like if you, if you own the Python service, then obviously that's your responsibility. But then, you know, if you reach that point to where you're like, oh, let's talk to, you know, so and so who wrote that, and then you know, or maybe I'll, you know, put in a PR or something. But yeah, there's there's a lot I feel like that is owned by the front end developer to make the experience better. Um, but it's a whole, it's also a whole platform thing, right? You want, um, like, monitoring came out of the DevOps space, like you're saying, and and like monitoring your cloud infrastructure and monitoring like, uh, you know, compute time and um, like cold starting and like all that stuff like that that's like sort of where it came out of and now it's reaching into like being able to a make sense of the front end too in a very powerful way so I think like it's it's sort of a it's a problem that's owned by everybody you know and you but you get to focus on um, your part of it you know so I think that's that's kind of the way I see it but was that was that helpful yeah. Yeah. Say, uh, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, what, so like what I've seen in the what I've seen as a baseline in the past is showing proof, and so like if a front end team adopts a really user monitoring solution and then shows that they're, they're catching their uh, perf issues before they even make it out to user land. Like, it's really powerful. Um, and that kind of story propagates to the other uh, development groups within a company, you know, uh, because monitoring can be done at every level, you know. So, like, uh, I feel like just being able to get your own, if you get buy-in from, from your team and you're able to do that, just showing off how uh, much that's changed to the, even the bottom line is also a really powerful way to get adoption within your company because people, like that Pinterest thing, you know, like, oh, like, <laughs> we, we had, fi our adoption rate went up like 15%. Because like people think it takes forty percent less time for this thing to load, you know, and so like that kind of stuff is extremely powerful and makes it really really valuable, yeah, and and is a good story to be able to help other people adopt it. Like you can't just you know like you're saying it's like how do you just you can't just like say this is a good way to go adopt it. And I, it's like if you if you can show it, you know, that's I think I feel I think that's the best way, yeah.
Yeah, thank you. I appreciate those questions. That was wonderful. Um, any more questions? No, are you guys, you, you all tired and ready for the uh, the last talk? <laughs> I, yeah, I did. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I just I wanted to make it enjoyable, and uh, I've been like messing around with animation more over time. Uh, utilize it like this. Um, the stuff that's like at the beginning. Uh, I'm gonna go back. So this stuff is um, like where's the one where it blows up? This stuff. Yeah, this stuff is all done in like P5.js. Um, which is a uh, like a WebGL uh, e like like really just like a grab and go like WebGL library that helps you. This is actually a bunch of rectangles that are spinning uh, <laughs> that create this sort of polygonal tube, <laughs> you know, or whatever. So uh, so there's that, and you know, I just have like this rasterized hand uh, going around in a circle, you know, or whatever. So like uh, you can you can do that kind of stuff with P5. I, I started a while ago like making my little like talk slide framework thing for it uh, that could help me do that more easily. Um, and then these ones, like I really um, being at li being at uh, scale really makes me want to understand how I could do it more without having to pay for things. I did the I did this with uh, Procreate, which is like an iPad tool, but like it's really been interesting because makes animations really easy and it's made it really fun and then it ha has helped uh, like it's gotten my kids started on making animations and stuff, which is pretty cool um, so those are the two tools that I use was like developing uh, you know the more um, WebGL stuff was P5.js and then uh, the other one was um, Procreate yeah so yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it, and thanks for coming, and hang in there, you're almost there, and uh, have a wonderful uh, Sunday, everybody. See ya. Thank you.